Hi, I'm John Bundrick, uh, consultant in medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester, and uh, I have authored uh, a paper entitled uh, Clinical Pearls in General Internal Medicine, which will appear in the January 2011 issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I want to tell you about three cases that are representative of the topics that we'll be discussing in the article. Uh, the first is that of a 69-year-old man with hypertension and hyperlipidemia uh, who has had two classic episodes of podagra uh, over the past, uh, per year over the past three years. Uh, he is on uh, several medications uh, including gemfibrozole, uh, tenolol, and lisinopril. Uh, he has the history of gout, uh, but uh, when he took allopurinol in the past, uh, he developed a rash and nausea. His other conditions include a mild uh, idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, as well as diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome. His examination is normal, apart from a tophus on the uh, DIP of the right index finger. Uh, he has no history of any uh, nephrolithiasis. His labs uh, show a normal uh, CBC and uh, chemistry group apart from a uric acid level of 7.2 milligrams per deciliter. His creatinine is normal and his lipids are within target. Uh, hypertension and hyperlipidemia are of course common conditions and they commonly coexist with hyperuricemia and gout. Uh, conveniently, uh, there are a few medications, a couple in, uh, in particular, uh, which not only uh, treat uh, hyperlipidemia or hypertension, but will also lower the serum uric acid. They do this through a uricose uric mechanism, uh, so they would be contraindicated in patients who have uh, uric acid uh, nephrolithiasis. Uh, the first of these is Losartan, and it uh, has been documented to produce a lowering of the serum uric acid by 10 to 15 percent, uh, even in patients who are already taking uh, phenofibrate. So these things can be uh, uh, additional to one another. Phenofibrate itself uh, has a more potent effect and uh, was demonstrated in one study to lower the serum uric acid by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, in patients who had tophaceous gout and were already taking allopurinol. Uh, again, if uh, these, these work through a uricose uric mechanism, and therefore if a patient has uh, uric acid uh, 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 nephrolithiasis, uh, they would be uh, contraindicated in that instance. So, the clinical pearl here is that uh, phenofibrate and losartan have uric acid lowering effects and uh, may be uh, good agents of choice uh, in patients who have a primary indication uh, for either drug, that is hypertension or hyperlipidemia. The next case is that of a 26-year-old female uh, who presents with 18 months of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, which developed after a self-limited episode of viral gastroenteritis. Uh, she describes it as a sharp burning discomfort that is well localized and is also a bit worse after eating and definitely worse after she has a bowel movement. Uh, her bowels are moving normally, however, and uh, she has not had any fever, weight loss, or uh, any other uh, systemic symptoms. Uh, she's been healthy apart from a mild depression, which is well controlled with fluoxetine, and she's on no other medications, uh, no smoking or ethanol. Uh, use. Uh, her evaluation so far has included an abdominal ultrasound which showed sludge in the gallbladder and an EGD which was normal. Her uh, BMI is uh, 30 kilograms per meter squared and her examination is relevant only for moderate focal tenderness in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. Her labs uh, are, show a normal CBC and chemistry group apart from a very mildly elevated ALT of 50. The question has to do with what would be the best next step in making a diagnosis in this patient. Turns out that the answer is something that's very low tech and it's called the Carnet Maneuver. Uh, this is a, 
a physical exam uh, maneuver that was first described by Dr. Uh, J.B. Carnett in 1926, the British surgeon, and it involves uh, localizing the point of maximum tenderness and then having the patient slightly tense their abdominal wall muscles, uh, either by raising their torso or raising their legs off of the table. The examiner uh, continues uh, uh, pressure on the spot of tenderness, and if the tenderness increases, or if it fails to decrease uh, during the tensing maneuver, uh, then the source of the pain can be reliably localized to the abdominal wall muscles, and a visceral or internal source can be reliably excluded. Uh, this patient uh, is a classic case of chronic abdominal wall pain. Uh, the features of that uh, are that it's generally described as being fairly constant in nature. They have it pretty much all day, day in and day out over long periods of time. It may be slightly worse after eating due to the associated abdominal distension of the stomach. Uh, and it is definitely worse after having a bowel movement uh, simply because of tensing of the abdominal uh, wall muscles. Uh, obesity and depression are common uh, comorbidities uh, with this condition, as are fibromyalgia and other painful conditions. Now the Carnet Maneuver is not only useful in diagnosis, but is also uh, helpful in educating and reassuring the patient regarding the true source of their pain. Uh, things such as local heat or ice treatments, uh, gentle stretching of the abdominal muscles, uh, physical therapy uh, types of maneuvers uh, can be helpful. And with conservative management, about 50% of people will improve considerably over a three-month period. Uh, for the remainder, uh, a trigger point injection of the painful spot uh, is successful about uh, two-thirds of the time and uh, perhaps to a slightly greater degree if it's repeated a second time uh, for those in whom the initial injection is ineffective. So the clinical pearl in this case uh, is that in patients with chronic abdominal wall pain, the Carnet maneuver can be very useful in both diagnosing the patient and in reassuring uh, those who receive that diagnosis. The third case is that of a 78-year-old male diabetic uh, who has been well controlled on metformin for the past five years. Uh, he otherwise feels well. He does report some mild paresthesia and decreased sensation in his toes, uh, but no other symptoms. Uh, he's had no other complications of his disease, and uh, he uh, has hypertension and hyperlipidemia, which are both well controlled on lisinopril and simvastatin. Uh, his examination is normal apart from a mild decrease in vibratory sensation in the toes. His labs uh, show a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3 percent, uh, negative microalbuminuria, and CBC and chemistry group are normal with a creatinine of 1.2. Uh, this case looks at the phenomenon of metformin-associated uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, this occurs in uh, uh, patients who have been on metformin for over three years at a dose of over 1.5 grams per day. So it is a dose and duration related adverse effect. In a recent randomized uh, trial using two and a half grams of metformin uh, per day over four years, uh, the treatment group had a 7.2% greater absolute risk of developing significant vitamin B12 deficiency compared to those who were on placebo. So that gives you some idea of the magnitude and the prevalence uh, of this condition. The mechanism is thought to be malabsorption of the food cobalamin complex uh, in the distal ileum, and um, this is a calcium, uh, an intraluminal calcium dependent uh, mechanism which is interfered with uh, by metformin. Uh, in one study, uh, which has not yet been replicated, uh, the use of supplemental uh, oral calcium uh, uh, produced greater absorption of vitamin B12 in patients who were on uh, metformin. 
so uh, stay tuned on that one. There may be some uh, benefit uh, to, the, to using calcium in this situation. Uh, but the bottom line is it would be reasonable to periodically check a vitamin B12 level in patients who have been on this dose of metformin uh, for more than about three years. That is the clinical pearl, uh, which is that significant vitamin B12 deficiency uh, may develop in patients who have been on metformin uh, for several years. So I hope you found these clinical pearls uh, useful. I found them very beneficial in my own practice, and there are uh, uh, several others uh, in the article that I hope you will enjoy as well. Uh, thank you. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.